Gareth was born to a single mother in the city of Clocktown. From the age of seven, he began to work alongside the master smith as his apprentice. Alvaric the smith taught him everything he knew. However, at the age of eleven, Gareth's mother succumbed to her illness that she'd been fighting for years, leaving Gareth all alone. He began to succumb to despair until a young girl, no older than he is, by the name of Erica, approached him. They soon became quick friends, and the girl's cheery smiles brightened up his days just a little bit. Alvaric decided to take the boy under his wing, treating him like a son, raising him, and continuing to hone his skills. Many years later, Alvaric suddenly, out of nowhere, passed on. Gareth was overcome by emotions on that day. He began to write in his journal, deciding to keep track of every single day, realizing just how fleeting life could be. Upon the end of this ceremony, Gareth decided that he must go. Many people expected him to take up Alvaric's place. However, he felt nowhere near ready. He packed his bags and set out in the middle of the night, only to be stopped at the, at the city gates by Erica. You, you, you can't be, you can't be leaving me behind. Not like this she said, anxiously trying to block his path. I'm sorry. I I just can't. I can't stay here. This, this city has too many memories. And I need to learn. I, I understand. She said, stepping out of his way watching him go. And so Gareth left, traveling west from Clocktown, soon finding rest at the edge of a mountain range. As he set up camp, he noticed he was being watched. A small pair of eyes peered above the rocky mountains hiding in the crevices and cracks. Soon, Gareth invited the strange being over, and they were revealed to be a short, young goblin. Gareth soon spoke with the goblin, inviting him for food. He learned his name was Gabo. He was abandoned by his tribe, he felt lost, with no direction in his life. Gareth noted how strange it was that he would encounter someone so similar to him so soon into his journey. He thought it was fate. He and Gabo then traveled together for a short while. Traveling through the mountain range, they stumble across a large cave diving in in search of rare ore or whatever else they could find, the curiosity of adventure driving them forward. They soon find mithril ore. Gareth decides to make his newfound friend a gift. Taking the mithril ore, he smiths a new blade, a small dagger, perfectly sized for the goblin, and presented it to him. Upon gifting the dagger, Gareth told Gabo to name it. Stinger, he replied, tears rolling down his face.
The pair soon found their way out of the mountain range, stumbling across a small village. Gabo was apprehensive about entering, fearing what may happen if he were to interact with the people inside. Gareth ensured him that he would be safe. And reluctantly, Gabo continued with him. They soon found a pub and began to have a good time. Gabo soon relaxed. However, a large, heavy-set man soon approached. Seeing the shiny new dagger on Gabo's belt, he reached out, grabbing it, mocking the goblin, saying it was too good for him. Gareth warned the man to return it to him. Of course, the man refused. So he proceeded to beat his teeth in. Returning Gabo's dagger, they left the pub. The two began to work together, solving small issues for the village. Gabo proved himself to be quite versatile and skilled. Gareth remarked just how crafty the goblin was, yet so loyal. The pair soon decides, after many weeks of work, that they will leave the village in search of more adventure and more knowledge. Newer lands, greener grasses, They stumble across a forest glade and begin to travel inside. However, they are set upon by a cyclops. Gareth is struck, badly injured, and Gabo manages to hide long enough for the beast to retreat. Scrambling to get help for Gareth, Gabo returns to the village, facing the people yet again and finds a priest. The priest's name is Olivia. Gareth tried to pay her for her work, nursing him back to health, health for two weeks, but she refused. Many more weeks passed as Gareth recovered. Gabo and Olivia seemed to grow very close. And when Gareth said he planned on leaving, Gabo informed him he planned on staying. Reluctantly, Gareth acknowledged that his friend would be happier here and set off on his own. Traveling alone, yet again, Seems to truly hit Gareth. It's a strange sensation. The utter solitude. However, shortly after leaving, he stumbles upon ancient ruins, hidden deep in the forest. Delving deep into them, he finds ancient carvings, as well as ancient tools. Spending the next week he studies all of the relics and pieces together what they mean. He learns and teaches himself Alduinian bone crafting, a lost technique. Shortly after leaving the ruins, prepared to try his technique out, he finds himself captured. The group who holds him hostage wishes for him to create them weapons with the Alduinian bone crafting. However, he refuses. He says that he would rather die than make weapons for people like them.
being left in the cell without any food. Gareth begins to ache, his strength leaving him. He wonders if help will ever come. Or maybe he will have to make good on his promise to die before he helps those who would hurt others. The next day, a strange group finds themselves in the same area as Gareth. Seeing Gareth chained and locked in a giant cell on the back of a carriage, the group attacks the captors, setting him free. He decides to travel with this group for a short while. Shortly after he began to travel with this group, Gareth finds himself struck with inspiration. An idea forms in his mind, and he takes to his journal to draw out schematics. He designs the Hopebringer Mark II, the first blade he ever forged, now being upgraded. One of the party that saved him, a warforged named Gopher, was also a smith, one who received his powers from the blacksmithing god. Gareth and Gopher had a competition, and Gopher was declared the victor, showing Gareth that he still had plenty to learn. A few days later, Gareth finally completed the Hopebringer Mark II. A few days later, the party finds themselves in a small forest hamlet. Every single person in the town seems to have such a thick accent that Gareth is unable to understand any of them. This soon drives him mad with anger, and he decides that he no longer wishes to stay in this town, staying in the cart, ready to leave. The group then traveled for a long period of time, traveling vast distances. Finally reaching a town called Fenric. But it's scorched to the ground. Just a pile of rubble and ash. Reluctantly, the group heads onward. Weeks later, the party finds themselves at their desired destination, Shigarl Lagarth, an ancient ruin, a relic of the past from battles thousands of years ago, sealed off by ancient magic. They find a way inside and search for cultists who they expect to be there. They soon find a shard. The purpose of the shard they do not know. They just know it to be a relic of importance and wish to keep it out of the hands of evildoers. Much later, the party arrives in a town known as Traverse. They find the town split into two major sections, the uppers and the lowers. The lowers being the dredges of the town. Everyone lives in poverty. The guards are under-equipped. Thieves run amok. Yet with nothing to steal. What's the point? The uppers live in the lap of luxury. Feeding off of the pain and suffering of the lowers. The party finds this to be unacceptable and decides that they will deal with this problem.
in their journey to find more information on the foes that they face. The party stops in an abandoned inn. They stay in the house, hoping to find shelter for the night. They find a few corpses littered throughout the house, but they are old, seeming to, seemingly having been there for years. They think nothing of it. In the night, strange stirrings happen. Signs of a large beast entering the house. Dreams of a monstrous creature trying to escape the ruins of the building. They're all awoken and enter the basement where they are attacked. In a frantic, frantic attempt to save himself from the blind darkness around him, Gareth casts a fire spell, trying to light a path, unaware that he caught the entire building on fire. The fire begins to rage, the storm outside doing little to quell the flames. An elemental of flame soon finds its way through the house and begins to attack the group. After a long and arduous battle, they manage to defeat the creature and the shade that stalked them. The next day, the group traveled through the sewers to the uppers, seeking to steal a, an important shield to help the rebellion. Gareth, the previous day, had forged many weapons to arm the militia for the battle that was to come. The party splits. Leaving Gareth and his newfound companion to travel towards the tower at the castle's peak, seeking to stop the mage from interrupting their plans as the others fight the guards in the square. He begins to climb and has come face to face with the archmage that he had hoped to take care of silently. The archmage, archmage kicks him in the face, knocking his hands free from the ledge of the windowsill. He begins to fall, re reaching desperately to grab for the building. His hands scrape against the brick. But eventually he finds purchase and catches himself. He climbs the rest of the way up the building, back to the windowsill, this time the mage unaware of his presence. He enters in, drawing his blade, Hope Bringer, igniting the blade with the chimera oil he had left, and gave everything he had to take down this mage. But it wasn't enough. The mage turned to him, smiling snapping his fingers, paralyzing Gareth, leaving him hopelessly standing and waiting for what was to come. With a maniacal laugh, the wizard holds out an outstretched hand as a gust begins to form in his palm before blasting forward, sending the paralyzed Gareth out of the window that he had just climbed in. Being launched 15 feet out the window, Gareth found himself without rope, without a grappling hook, and with no way to catch himself for the 200-foot fall below him. Realizing that these were some of the last moments he had left in his life, he quickly pulled out the journal he had kept daily and wanted to write one last thing. He quickly scribbled down, Well, this is it. I have but one regret. I couldn't. He hit the ground. 
struggling to hold on to his life. He fought with death. The only thoughts in his mind. Not now. Not yet. His mind went blank. His companions later found his body the next day, having finished their battle and having been victorious.